Good morning. It is a good morning to see everybody who's out and about with us uh, this day. I'm very glad to, to see everyone and be able to, to talk with everyone. And I hope everyone feels uh, comfortable and excited to be here this morning. This morning's lesson, the, the worship the Lord desires. Now, last week, uh, we looked at the worship the Lord does not desire. The worship the Lord doesn't want. Cold worship. God doesn't want cold worship. He doesn't want us just going through the motions. He doesn't want us just doing things just for the sake of doing things. And when we begin, we start thinking about what Sunday morning is. Sunday morning isn't the meeting at the country club. It is not a time that we just get together so we can just check off that we were there today and that our attendance has been recorded and therefore we're just another step in being great. That's not what worship's about at all. And in fact, again, we'll look at uh, Vine's four definitions of the verb that translated worship. The first one is, it is to give utmost respect. Utmost respect. After all, who is the object of our worship? Almighty God of the universe. Now think about that for a second. He is the one that said, let there be light and there was light. He was the one that made a plan for our souls, the redemption of our souls, even before we were born. Jesus is called the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. He had, a, he had in mind, before the first sin ever was committed, that if there ever was a chance he needed it, Jesus would die. You know, when we look, read the book of James, we find that every good, every perfect gift comes down from the Father of life. Every good and perfect gift comes from Him, comes from heaven above. And so we sit down and think about that. Worship is given the utmost respect to Him. To Him. That's amazing. That's amazing. Uh, to show reverence. To show reverence. To put God in a, a high esteem. To put God in the top place. Not a place in our life. We live in a society where we can just put things in little compartments like our desk drawer, we shove them in there and that's where they belong. And we just lock Jesus up. It's almost as if in society we can just put Jesus on when we come into the building and take him off when we leave. But that's not what God wants. And when we're here, we respect the most holy God. We are in his very presence. Well, to honor religiously, and to act piously or righteously. That's worship. That's coming together to, to give God the first place in our life. The paramount place. And that is why we're here today. The psalmist said in Psalm 21 verse 17. That the sacrifice of the psalmist was a broken heart. A broken spirit and a contrite heart. When it comes to God he thinks about those things. We just observe the Lord's Supper. We go to 1 Corinthians in chapter 11. Well, we are to examine ourselves. Now in that context is how we relate to our brethren. But when we start thinking about the Lord's Supper, how did we live this week? What was our life like? Was it one that honored God? And we need to think about these things. Is it one that did not honor God? And we need to ask for forgiveness. We, we get to think about those things. We get to, to come to God with this. In John chapter 4, verses 23 and 24, when Jesus is at the, the well in Samaria, he's talking to this lady. And she says, you Jews says you worship in Jerusalem, but our father said, we worship on this mountain. And she wanted to know what was Jesus' response. The father is looking for those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. For those who worship him must worship him in spirit and that's with the right attitude and truth, knowledge and understanding. See, that's the thing about the God we serve. The God we serve doesn't want us to be not knowing. He tells us everything we need to know. But He also wants us to do it from here. From here. When Jesus was asked what's the greatest commandment of a law, you realize Jesus could have said anything. And so his answer was one we've got to pay attention to. What's the answer? Love the Lord your God with all 
all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, all your soul. Now think about that. Love the Lord with everything that is in you. Love the Lord. Now think about that for a second. Think about that. Last week I made mention there are people who says, why do you get anything out of that? There were people who say things like, well, there's just another week. I punched my meal ticket. I'm good to go. Why can people say that? Because when we're here, God wants our heart. And if we're not giving him our heart, then we're not ready to worship the way he desires. And so two things I want to look at this morning as we consider this idea of worship. First of all, I want to, to talk more about this myth. This myth that we just come together for whatever reason. Because that's not true. It is not the thing to do, and it's not just because the door is open. We have a particular reason. There are three of these that we're going to look at. The Hebrews writer laid them out so we can understand why is it we come here? Why is it we gather together? Why is it when, you know, and I'm glad there are people who are still able to enjoy worship with us, but why is it we long to be together? Why is that? The Hebrews writer tells us. We're going to turn to Hebrews 10. We'll find that out. And then we're going to look at how we're supposed to do these certain things while we're here. Because after all, there are certain things we're supposed to do while we are here. And so we're going to focus on those that we call the five acts of worship. And so first of all, we're coming together. Why? Why? Now think about this just for a second. The Hebrews writer is addressing a problem. A big problem. God's people are turning away from Jesus and they're going back to an old law which cannot save them. That is a problem. In fact, as Sean, my, my son Sean pointed out the other day, that that, you know, the epistles all address a problem. That's why they're written. Except for Philippians. They're addressing some kind of problem. And if you want to look back at the Old Testament, when prophets come on the scene, there is a problem. And they address things. And so the Hebrews writer is addressing not turning away from Jesus and going back to, to Judaism because life is hard for them. In fact, when you read Hebrews, their life is very hard. Their friends, their family, the people they live around are all putting pressure on them because they follow Jesus. And what was the Hebrews writer's response in chapter 10? Therefore, brethren, in verse 19, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God. Notice how he sets this up. A new and living way. Well, following Jesus gives us life. It gives us life. We walk the narrow way where we end up. We end up in life. Notice in verse 12 and 22. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Why do we come to this building and gather together? Because this is a place we can draw near to. We draw near to God here. This is where we say, God, you're God. I am not God. God, you know exactly which way to go. I don't know which way to go. This is where God, when I made a mistake, I really messed up. I want to walk in your way. See, that happens when we worship God anywhere, particularly when we are together. See, there's no wonder, there's no wonder that the proverb, the Psalms write the Proverbs, he says that by taking advice from many counselors. You know, have you ever been in a situation where you thought you knew the right answer? And just to be wrong, I've been there many times. And we get to find out when we look at God's word and we understand what it says, how we live and what we look like. And when we got it wrong, we say, Lord, I, I want your way. I want your way above my way. Because it's all about you. Notice 
verse again, verse 23. Hold fast our, the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Hold fast to that confession. What is it? Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. He is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. We get to be reminded of that. We get to reaffirm that every time we come together. Have you ever thought about this? As people drive by, they look up here, and they see your car, and guess what they say? So and so's at church today. And some people are saying, I wonder why they're at church today. What does it give you opportunity to do? I believe in the one that was able to save our souls. And I yearn to be there. But you're like, preacher, those last two things wouldn't do anywhere. Absolutely. So let's keep reading. Verse 24. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another in so much more as we see the day approaching. Stir up. Well, I can give, give you all kinds of examples for that. If you ever baked a cake, you got to stir that stuff up. If you don't stir it up, right, guess what? It doesn't turn out. But the word actually means to aggravate. To aggravate. To love and good works. Now think about this for a second. Have it, has any of you ever had a younger brother or sister? Now I have three brothers and a sister. Did they ever want my attention? Yes. Did they ever tug on me and say, I want you over here? Yes. Did I always do what they wanted me to do? No. Did they ever stop asking? No. That's aggravating. Well, maybe we have children. And it's been a really, really long day at work. It has been a hard day at work. Things have seemed to just burn down. But when you show up, guess what? They don't care. They say, Mommy, do this with me. Daddy, do this with me. Mamma, Papa, do this with me. Do it with me. But baby, I'm tired. Please, Daddy, please. What are they doing? They're stirring us up to love and good works. It's always good to show your family love. It's to show everyone love. Why do they come together? Because sometimes we get complacent and we need to stir it up in here and say, this is what it's all about. This is really what life is. Because when we get too complacent, we look around and we think our life is cars and houses and clothes and jobs and boating and fishing and hunting and sports. And we have all this around us and it all wants our attention. And in and of themselves are not really bad. Until when? They're up here. Do not forsake verse seven. That's the only verse many people understand in the whole chapter. If you miss church, because I'm calling you and saying you can be there. Or we're going to church. Or we're going to keep yeah. Why should we be together? Because we love one another and want each other to go to heaven. That's, that's why we're together. That's what draws us together. Why is it important to me wanting to come together? Because we need this. That's why. We miss this. That's why we're together. We're not here just for attendance cheap. It's, like, it's, it's sad to me. It saddens me when people say, oh, where are you at now? I'm in Greenville. How many people are there? What are we doing here? That's the first question I really want to ask people. And you know what follows it up? What's the contribution? I have no idea. It's not about the contribution. This isn't a bank. This is a church. We should be loving people and giving hope and cheer. There are many people in this community that need answers that you know, that I know. They're broken, and the only super glue they have is Jesus to put them back together. We are light bearers. There's a church 
in Virginia. Front row. At the end of the door, over the door, it says, you are now entering the mission field. And that's exactly what happened when we leave the congregation. There are people who need us. That's why we're here. So why do we come here to draw near to God? Why do we come here? Hope fish our confession. Hope our confession. Why do we come here to encourage one another to love and to good works? So preacher, how do we do that? Oh, he told us how to do that too. And the way we want to do this is I'm going to look at what we've done today. Turn our Bibles over to Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18, there are two men. In Luke chapter 18, Jesus is talking about prayer. Prayer is our communication to our most heavenly Father. Yes, I know, and you know, He knows every single thing. I know that. He knows everything we need. I know that. But if we're going to draw into Him, we still got to lay our hopes on Him. We got to lay our dreams on Him. We got to lay our frustrations, our concerns. We lay it on Him. Because after all, He is the one who can take care of all of those things that we're powerless to. Now notice, we do this, I want us to look at the heart of the matter. Because worship comes from here and here. Spirit, truth. Notice in verse 10, two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, a teacher of the law, a religious teacher. If you wanted to think about it this way, a preacher, an elder, a deacon, someone who's serving the church. And, a, and a, the other tax collector, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, those people who take money uh, from you, uh, unjust, adorers, or even as this tax collector, I fast twice a week, I give tithes of all that I possess. Now what is he saying? God, you should be glad that I'm on your side. I'm not like the little sinner people out there. I'm not even like this guy I'm at church with. We got the tax collector. And the tax collector stood far off. Well, not even so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breath, saying, God, be merciful to me and sinner. Now, as this is saying, I know this is twisted. Now, I want us to understand that they're both at the temple, they're both Jews, and this is a parable. This is not about salvation. This is all about attitude. Attitude. Lord, I'm just a sinner. Without you, I am hopeless. Hopeless. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. He who humbles himself will be exalted. And when we pray, it's how we ought to pray. When we pray, it's how we ought to pray. From our hearts. With understanding. And you know, there are times that I don't know what to pray for. There are some times I'm just so broken hearted the words just won't come out. Romans chapter 8, the Spirit intercedes for you when that happens. Pray anyway. He knows your heart. Pray anyway. Colossians chapter 3. This is one of the, the texts we go to often to say that we don't use it in this room or use it because of this. But there's a heart thing. There's two heart things that we're going to look at in verse 16. Notice what Paul writes. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in our wisdom. And notice that. Colossians 3 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. We're going to know what God's word says. We're going to do what he next instructs us to do. We've got to understand. And it has to be part of us. This is not head knowledge things. This is the Lord's word is part of us. Teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Notice one another. As he gives this out, whatever he tells us to do, we all do it to one another. We all do it together. What are we doing? 
We're singing songs, hymns, and spiritual songs. How do we teach? How do we admonish one another? Through the words that we sing. The words that we sing. Like preachers are just words. I understand that. I had a gentleman one time that said, I, I cannot sing the song. Will work. I said, brother, why not? Because it has the word sucker there. I said, oh, I understand, brother. I understand. You don't understand what that word means. Because what he's thinking about is nursing. But that's not the word. When the baby is fussy and the baby is whining, and all it wants is his mama to hold him, or his daddy to hold him, and to calm him down, that word is sucker. S U C C O R. Now, when's the next time you're going to sing that song? Sing. We'll work, and there's times I need comfort. That's the reason we help each other through our songs, through our singing. Notice, sing with grace in our hearts to the Lord. See, that's where it comes from. Whatever is in us, the Lord's word within us has to come out. And that's how we sing. That's how we sing. The words that are in us come out. Now I thought about this. I wanted to read this amazing grace and to start singing it and to see how many people could remember. The reason we have song books is because sometimes we learn the songs differently. We do. We absolutely do. We had a case of that this morning. It wasn't planned. That's why we have song books. But have a song lyric. So we sing the same thing so we're not in confusion. So we can teach and admonish and encourage one another. That's why we sing with grace from here. We observe verse 7, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And as we look turn here, normally we, we focus primarily on the, on the section uh, about you know, reading you know, take this, this is my body, and this is the new covenant. But what I want to do is, I want to, to look down. I want to look down at verse 28. Notice it says, what's it, let's go to 27, 28 is the deal. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup in, of the Lord in an unworthy manner, the word, the word there is an adverb. It, it, it doesn't talk about you, it talks about the manner in which you partake it. They're having problems with this. We'll be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord, but let a man examine himself. And so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Now, it could be because we're talking about the Lord's Supper, that's his, that we're thinking about Jesus' body on the cross. But when we look at the context of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, they didn't have problems with that. They have problems with people in the church. Remember, we talked about that last week. You can look up, starting in verse 17. They come together. They didn't come together for the better, but for the worse. For each one takes a supper ahead of another, and the other one is drunk. Not that they wasn't waiting on each other. They wasn't considering one another. They were just acting and reacting and going through emotions and going through emotions. But when we sit down and say, test yourself. Think about yourself. Think about where you are in the Lord's body. Think about we wouldn't even be there if it wasn't for Jesus. We wouldn't have our sins forgiven if it wasn't for Jesus. It's from the heart. It's not a mindless ritual. That's not something we should just go through the motions with. This is where we sit down and say, this is Almighty God and His people. And we're part of one another. Have I behaved myself? Example. Nehemiah chapter 8. Nehemiah chapter 8. Now I understand this is in the Old Testament. And as we think about Nehemiah, I always think about this. I want us to think about spreading of the word. Now what I mean by this 
This is after Babylon captivity. So Israel has already been taken captivity. Judah's already been taken captivity. And they get to come back to rebuild the wall and the temple. That's why they're coming back. Well, the day is just finished. They've rebuilt the wall, they've rebuilt the temple, and they're getting ready to dedicate this city once again to the most holy God. Notice in verse 1. Now all the people that gathered together as one man in the open square that was in the front of the water gate, and they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly of men and women, and all who could hear with understanding. Now notice that. Everybody who could understand what he was saying was present. They're standing there. In verse 3, Then he read from me in the open square that was in front of the water gate from morning until midday, before the men and women and all those who could understand, and the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. Now, could you imagine that? We see here for an hour. Could you imagine standing for hours reading the book of the law? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. So Ezra, the scribe, stood on a platform of wood which, which they had made for the purpose. And beside him had a giant hand stood, and there's several men here, and he's laying down, there's eight people up here. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing of all the people, and he opened it, and all the people stood. And Ezra read the, read the Lord, blessed the Lord, the great God. And all the people answered, Amen, Amen. That means, let be so. When people pray, we say amen after them, we say we agree. Let it be as you say. And while lifting their hands, they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Notice verse 8. So they read distinctly from the book and the law of God, and they gave the sense and helped them to understand the reading. Now notice, we have a responsibility. I have a big responsibility. Because I stand up and I'm looking at God's word and we're giving this out. But as we give it out, we got to make it make sense. we got to make it understandable. we got to make it applicable so we can understand how to use this stuff. I used to, I used to work at a, a preaching camp. And I said, you know the difference between a book report and a sermon? They said, what? I said, in a book report, you give the facts. In a sermon, you say, this is how you use it. And some of the things that, that comes to my mind is this. There, there are people who say, I'm glad. I can hear it. And then there are some people that, that I've heard say, I don't understand the word that preacher's saying. If we've got to put words for it in a dictionary, we're in trouble. People should understand when they hear. And the flip side of this, we, you also have a responsibility. You've got to listen because there's a lot of I can get it all wrong. And you get to talk to me about it. But think about the attitude of the people that day that stood there from morning to midday hearing these words. They wanted to be there. They wanted to thus say the Lord. They wanted to understand. And there were people that were walking around helping people understand the book. Why? Because it's God's word to them. Why? It's God's word to us. It's we've got to understand. We've got to understand. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 is the midst of a conversation where Paul is trying to get these brethren to go ahead and take up a contribution to help these saints. Notice what he says in verse 7. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart. His heart. Giving starts with the heart. See, he's already made a connection with the Macedonians. 
The Macedonians didn't have anything. But they gave because they gave of themselves first. Go, go back to our reading in chapter 6. They gave themselves first, and so they gave them this big offering. Not grudgingly or of necessity. Don't give if you feel bad about it. And don't give if someone's going to make you feel bad. For the Lord, for God loves a cheerful giver. We should be happy when we give. Why? God has given us all of this. Whatever this looks like. He has allowed you the stewardship to look over his things. He's giving you money. He's giving you time. He's giving you houses. He's giving you stuff. And when we come together with opportunity to give the Lord back some of his stuff for his work. And we give it back, we give it back in appreciation. Appreciation. When was the last time we sat down and said, I'm glad I'm able to give this amount. So others that do not know the Lord can come to know the Lord. That those who are struggling may have something in time of need. And when we go down, notice in verse 8, and God is able to make all grace abound towards you that you having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. And when we look at this, how do they have an abundance? How? Because we've been given. We get to help. We have a part in that. We're a part in what's going on here. And so now it's not only just the preacher or the elders or the deacons, now it's everybody gets to contribute to the work that we get to do. And so we need to ask, what can I do as part of this? Why are we here? Put God first. Why are we here? Draw near to Him. Why are we here? To stir up, to aggravate one another, to provoke His word in the King James. To love and good works. Help each other love each other. Do good to them. Well, how do we do that? We pray with the heart. We love the Lord God first of all with our heart. We pray that way. We pray that way. We sing that way. It comes out of here. Now I understand it's a lot of to do out of here, but it comes from here. We do it to help one another. We listen to God's word being spoke. Why? It's his word to us. It's this is his word. So we want to apply it. We want to live it. We listen to it here. Not just here. We consider the Lord's body to take the Lord's supper. And we think about it here. We think about how we've been. And how we ought to be. Here. We give, not just from back here, we give right here. We give right here. Why, should we, why do we do this? Because we love Jesus. We love our Heavenly Father. We love the Holy Spirit that gave us His words. We sit down and we think about this. What should our attitude be like? Love you. Care you. Now we stir each other up a little bit. Today, how do you worship the Lord? Are you giving Him something that you're proud of? Are you giving Him something because you respect Him? Are you giving Him all that you have? I mentioned a couple weeks ago in the second service, I'm glad I went to worship Christ on Sunday with the brothers. And the sisters. And I mean that. I don't lie about that. There's no reason to lie. I enjoy doing these things. Why? Because God loved us. And I'm going to be a little selfish. He loves me. And he loves you too. This morning, if you're not yet for Christ in the baptism, every sins for you. Why not do it today? If you've done that, you're going to stray. 
Why not repent, come back to him today? We pray with you, we pray for you if need be. Or maybe you have another need outside salvation that you need to be let know. You can come forward after seeing this, your invitation song.